Um, your new article in Science talked about interactive effects and missing institutions. Could you explain a bit more about that? Well, yeah, let's um, take the second part first, the missing institutions. Um, most of the institutions that we have in the world today that have developed successfully that for, for controlling the way in which we use our resources have been developed at scales that people operated at, which were local scales and up to national scales. And the, the, the institution of the nation has been a very powerful thing for, since Thomas Hobbes for 300 years. And what, what that's been able to do is prevent people from destroying a nation in large. And um, the difficulty is, is that many of the problems that we now have are beyond the, the scale of the nation, they're global in scale. But all of the, the inbuilt, strong institutions we have are national scale institutions. So we're struggling to try and figure out how we can cooperate as a globe. As a, as a, how do we get to behave as if we were all one nation? And we don't want one national government for the whole world or one global government. But that's the problem, is that we don't have institutions that operate well at the scale of the globe. We have a few. So we have uh, things like the WTO, and some people have concerns about aspects of the WTO. But nevertheless, it works, and most nations agree to it. So they give away some national authority for a greater good that eventually does them good. We get some distance along that with the, um, the World Health Organization, because people really have an uh, and recognition that their own well-being depends on global well-being in that sense. But when we come to things like a rapid ecological change and climate change, we can see what, how difficult, he, difficult it is at the moment with things like the climate change agreements. We've had success where it was easier with the ozone issue, which was the Montreal Protocol. That worked because it wasn't really difficult to make that work. There was an easily available substitute that people could put in place. And, and, and so it, it was something that, um, that was doable. But we're grappling now with how people can give away the advantages for themselves operating at a national scale to operate and work collaboratively at international scales. And it's compounded by the fact that we work in a piecemeal way. So each of these problems is tackled as if it was a separate thing that we could tackle. But they interact. And that's why we talk about interactive effects of global drivers. And, um, and, and we lack institutions not only that operate at the global scale, but we lack institutions that take into account the interactions between these different drivers. So for instance, some of the uh, efforts being driven at the moment at the international scale is to get an agreement um, just trying to pick one off the top of my head right now, but let's say the biofuels debate. How can we um, stop mining carbon, the old carbon, and adding it to the atmosphere by perhaps using biofuels? Well, that's fine, but if we keep with that single thing in mind, what we're ignoring is the what are the secondary effects of promoting biofuels? And there's a lot of examples now coming out of the literature where if this results in pushing crops for biofuels into regions that are marginal for crop growth and you put a lot of extra nitrogen on to make them work. The economics might say, look, this is quite good. And some nation might be able to, in the short term, make some money out of the biofuels program. But the secondary effects on other aspects of the climate and on other aspects of the environment, such as in the case of America, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is being made worse by the fact, it could be certainly made much worse by the fact that a lot more cropping will take place in semi-arid areas with more fertilizers that eventually run off into rivers. So these are the interactive effects. And uh, we don't take those into account. All of the institutions, we deal with if they're separate and isolated, whether they're health, whether they're environment, whatever. So we're trying to understand how do we put in place institutions that work across these interactive effects at the global scale. As a result of research, the research you use today, not only the adaptation capacity, but also um, transformation, transformability. Um, can you tell us a bit about the difference between, between adaptation and transformation? 
Well, that's really very key. And of course, adaptation is kind of obvious. You Things change and so you adapt. People do that all the time. And in itself, that, that's entirely appropriate. But there comes a time when if the external conditions have shifted fundamentally so that the kind of thing you're trying to adapt actually has got beyond the point of being adaptable, then everything you do actually just makes it worse. And um, it, I think this is often best summed up in the words of Warren Buffett, the, the great investor, and he, he talked about the first rule of holes. And the first rule of holes is that when you're in one, stop digging. And the reason why that makes sense is that everything you do to try and, and not um, die, if you want, yes, or collapse as a system, it's a kind of a slight edge to what you're doing, but it actually is just digging the whole deeper. There are parts of the world, for example, parts of the Sahel, other parts of the world, where people in small communities are caught in poverty traps. And, and trying to adapt to those poverty traps actually just makes it worse and worse. What they have to do is transform to a different mode of living, a different way of, of earning a living, of functioning. And that is kind of opposite in many ways to adaptation. If, if you look at it from the point of view of an industry, there is often, instead of looking at it from a regional perspective, it sometimes gives a pointer to this. If, for example, we were looking at only adaptation and, and thinking it was appropriate that all industries should be given the right to adapt and do it, well then, the asbestos industry would still be trying to adapt to make itself a viable industry. But as knowledge became available and as the effects of asbestos became apparent all over the world, we had to transform. We had to transform into a way of doing things that no longer involved asbestos. But if it had been left up to the proponents and masters of the asbestos industry, they would have persisted and prolonged the adaptation process. So I think the tobacco industry is, is following in the footsteps of the asbestos industry. So I'm suggesting that Adaptation can sometimes be a negative aspect prolonging what actually has to happen. And if that happens in the context of human well-being and lifestyles, it makes it more and more difficult to transform the longer that hole is being dug deeper. So it's a tension zone because in many cases it may not be necessary to transform and then adaptability is very important and we need to promote it. So this is not an easy question to answer, but that's the distinction. Do you, do you think it's possible for humans to change, change the way of thinking and, and indeed? I think they have. And I think if it was not possible, we'd be in serious trouble. But um, times change, circumstances change, and what was considered okay by people is suddenly no longer considered okay. We got rid of slavery. In the middle of the last century, there were long debates in the houses of Parliament in Great Britain that the entire future economy of the world depended on the continuation of slavery. Well, that was shown not to be so, and, and it's gone. So we do change. We change in many ways, and people have evolved, and their behavior, and their, their, their touchstones of ethics shift and evolve as well. What we have to do is to try and see what is in the long-term best interest of human well-being and what kind of behavior do we need to adopt to enable us to improve people's general well-being all over the world. And, and it depends on that behavior changing because it's that kind of ethical touchstone that will eventually be the major constraint on those who, who are trying to not go along with the changes that we need.